Welcome to another of our roundtable discussions on the book of Isaiah. I'm Richard Draper, Associate Dean of Religious Education, and with me today are three of my colleagues from the Department of Ancient Scripture. Brother Paul Hoskison. Paul. Good to be here. Glad to have you here. Michael Rhodes. Good to have you here, Mike. Good to be here, Richard. And Ray Huntington. It's good, good to team up with uh, you today. Our topic is going to uh, come from chapters 24 through 26. Scholars call chapters 24 through 27 the apocalyptic Isaiah. Prophecy is, is that uh, kind of prescience that God shares with his uh, children, which uh, shows history as it flows from the present into the future without interruption. Apocalyptic, on the other hand, looks at a specific point in time, that is, the point at which God moves into history forcefully and powerfully, brings one history to an end, that of the telestial world, and begins a brand new history, that of the terrestrial or millennial world. Here we see Isaiah concentrating on that particular period and therefore bringing to us insights and understanding that are very relevant to those of us who live today. In chapter 24, verse 1, we read, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Mike, uh, put this uh, chapter, this, this section, uh, into its setting for us, would you please? Okay, well, uh, basically the, the previous uh, 11 chapters, Isaiah 13 through 23, Isaiah has been uh, prophesying about the various nations that surround Israel, uh, Babylon, Moab, Syria, Egypt, uh, uh, Duma, uh, which is Edom, uh, Arabia, Timna, Kedar, uh, Tyre, Sidon. So he's, he's geographically uh, looked at all of the uh, countries around uh, the uh, area and basically uh, predicted uh, destruction for each of those. And now, uh, beginning with chapter 24, we turn back to Judah in Israel uh, and, and specifically in the context of events of the last days. And, 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 and let me just add also that, that each of these things, uh, prophecies about the, these nations surrounding Israel and uh, Judah, uh, also had, the, as Isaiah often does, double meaning and, and could uh, refer to events in the last days, uh, various foreign nations being destroyed in the last days, as well as contemporary with the time of Isaiah or shortly thereafter. And therefore we see conditions existing in Isaiah's day that then allows the prophet through his Syriac power to look to the last days and therefore begin to really concentrate on what, what's happening in the world in these last days. All right, so, so what do we have here? Uh, let's take a look at uh, verses uh, 2 through 6, uh, maybe 2 through 13. What, what do we see here? Paul, what, what, what do you see as kind of the message? What's, what's going on? One of the first things that strikes you in verse 2 is that uh, uh, as with the people, so with the priest, uh, as with uh, the master, so with the maid, and so on. In other words, uh, it's going to happen to everyone. There's uh, the whole, uh, all of the people are going to be involved. Uh, it's not going to be the low people or the high people. Everyone will be there. In verse 3, then, the, the land is going to be utterly emptied, emptied and spoiled, for the Lord has spoken his word. Down through uh, verse 12, this is a time of general mourning about the destruction which is <clears throat> going to happen. Uh, during this time period that we're talking about here. Very good. Notice uh, verse 5, or actually verse 4, it tells us why there, why these destructions are coming uh, upon the earth. The earth. The earth mourneth, it fadeth away, the world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do language. Again, this uh, word haughty uh, is, is not just simply pride, but a pride that expresses itself by looking down at others, a, a pride that exists uh, to be self-promoting and, and does that at the expense of, of all other people. And therefore, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. What, what do you see in there, Ray? What, what, what is the dynamic? What's the problem? I, you know, the, <clears throat> the word that, I, that, that, that jumps out to me in those verses, at least in verse 4, is that, uh, that word languish. 
which uh, has the sense of losing energy or, or, or drooping. And um, the, the idea that the earth fades away, the world languish and fadeth away, the haughty people languish. In other words, um, prior to the second coming um, and also taking it back to Isaiah's time period, there's this sense that the wicked have uh, slowly burned themselves out. They're less, they're, they're less intensive with their sin. They, they've, I think they've come to a point where they've partied so much that they've just done themselves in. But not only that, the earth becomes defiled because of that. And uh, what have they done? Isaiah says they've done three things. They've transgressed the laws. They've changed the ordinances. They've broken the everlasting covenant, which is the gospel covenant. They're in serious, serious apostasy. Is what he's does this, about does the covenant here have something to do with the Abrahamic covenant, which they certainly have not been uh, uh, staying oh, with? Oh, I think it has to, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, this this is is, is reminiscent <clears throat> of the um, uh, proclamation on the family at the end of that proclamation, where the uh, they state, if the uh, inhabitants of the earth do not, I'm paraphrasing, uh, do not uh, change their, their stance on the family and, and start building up the family, which is the essence of the everlasting covenants, it makes eternal families, the, the destructions prophesied anciently and modernly are going to come upon them. So our prophets today are, are repeating the message that, that Isaiah is giving us right now. And probably uh, we need to hear the message, that is the world needs to hear the message as they did, because uh, we're, we're doing the same thing they did. Mm -hmm. We're changing the laws, uh, breaking the covenants and so on. And it's interesting in verse 16, it shows us the result. Verse six, therefore say, uh, therefore hath the curse devoured the earth because they have done these things. And they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men left. That certainly feels last days, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Second yeah. coming. Let, Second let, let me give you a quote yeah. here from, from Elder McConkie re regarding this. In the coming day when the vineyard of the Lord is burned, some few will abide the day, but the masses of men will be destroyed. Only those who are quickened, as were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace of Nebuchadnezzar, shall be able to abide the day of burning. The few oh, that are left, I mean, they're going to be in that burning, but they're going to be protected, just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. Because of their righteousness, right? Uh, that's brought out here in Isaiah in, in verse 13. After we get the end of the destruction, or the destruction talked about down through verse 12, in verse 13, when thus it shall be in the midst of the land, when we have all of that destruction going on among the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the gleaning grapes when the vintage is done. That is, uh, in those days, you would, you would hit the tree with a stick, the olive tree, to knock the, the olives out, and you would go through and you would cut off the grape clusters. But there are always some left over in the olive tree and some left on the vines. And there's, in other words, there's going to be a remnant left, as uh, Elder McConkie has said. And those, that remnant that's left after the destruction in verse 14 will lift up their voice and sing for the majesty of the Lord. Let me just uh, make a note uh, before we move on to that one, and that is uh, what we see through uh, in verses uh, 9 through 11 is the fleeting moment of pleasure. I mean, th th these guys have their, their moment of rejoicing. You know, uh, they're down at the pool hall. They have <laughs> their, uh, their cabarets and so on. But what happens? It all ceases. It all comes to an end, and it comes to a very sharp end. Yes. And then, oh, there is great mourning. Yes. Okay, so uh, picking up now with uh, verse, verse, verse 16, right? What, what do you see in this next section? Or did you have something, Paul? I was just say that 16 is now uh, what this remnant is going to do. We're, they're going to sing these songs that are mentioned there at the beginning of 16. But I, stand, uh, but I said, my leanness, my leanness, woe unto me. What's going on there? Sorry, I, this, this may be Isaiah speaking, you know, in, in seeing this, this destruction that's going on, it's painful to him as a prophet. Others have suggested it may be the Lord, uh, and it may be both, you know, a prophet and the Lord, and, and, and righteous people do not rejoice when they see the wicked destroyed. And therefore, it is causing a, 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 a real anguish. An anguish to, to have to see in, this. Inside of them, uh-huh. 
Uh, and we have to remember that, that it doesn't make the Lord happy when, as it says in verse 19, the earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean, dissolved, the earth is mm -hmm. moved exceedingly. I mean, th th this is not a, a place of rejoicing, but rather of deep and abiding sorrow. But also, do we see here now movement into the very last time? Are we moving now uh, to that uh, period that we talked about that Isaiah is looking at apocalyptically where things are really radically changing? We're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, verse, verse 18 is, is, is nice in, in uh, showing that there's no escape for the wicked. Uh, he that fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. I mean, he's running from one thing and he falls into a pit. You, you can't escape the, this, this destruction that's coming upon you. Verse seven, oh, excuse me, Mike, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm no, listening. I was going to say, verse 17, too, has that same thought. Uh, fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee. In other words, the wicked are going to be hunted. They're going to yeah. be ensnared and trapped, and quite frankly, they're not going to get away. And then through all of this, the, that remnant that is left who have not uh, indulged in such things in, in verse 16 are going to be singing these songs. But, but going on down to, uh, towards uh, tw uh, verse 22, there comes a point, though, uh, where they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. When all of this is, is brought to a winding up position in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. The Lord will visit them after many, many days. And, and I think this is, is clearly talking about spirit prison, uh, you know, the uh, spirit world. Uh, after they've been destroyed, they're eventually going to get a chance to, to hear the gospel and, and, and at least in, in some measure make up for what they did and, and enter into their glory, whether it's telestial or terrestrial. It'll be the telestial or the ones that are going to be burned up at this time. Yeah. So. And, and then we move right into verse 23 because yes. we're, we're dealing with last day's things. So here comes the Lord. And what happens when the Lord comes? Then the moon shall be confounded and the <laughs> sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. Was, can you imagine a presence so, br so bright that the moon shall be confounded? And, and I love the word, the sun shall be ashamed. <laughs> I mean, just normally the sun dominates the heavens and then here comes the one who made the sun and all of a sudden the, the power of the sun seems so weak and so on. R reminds you in many ways of the first vision when the prophet said that he saw the pillar of light above the brightness, above the brightness of the noonday sun. Yeah, and in yes. another account he says it had the power to eclipse yeah. the brightness yeah. of the noonday sun. Yeah. And I think Isaiah is looking at this moment and just exulting and so on, which yes. then leads us to chapter 5, which is uh, 25. Uh, chapter 25, thanks Mike, uh, which is a really a psalm of praise. O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things, thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, the individual here, seeing the Lord now moving against the oppressors, Result, or just uh, exalts in this moment. And uh, it would appear, as we take a look at this, that, that there is two reasons for this exaltation. One is in verse 2, for thou hast made a city and heap. In other words, the Lord has come against the oppressors, uh, and uh, therefore the righteous have been vindicated. But also verse 4 is important. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm and shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible ones uh, is as the storm against the walls. In other words, uh, the righteous don't have to wait just until the end time where the Lord will vindicate them. But even during the period of oppression, the Lord's there to strengthen them and to help them through these things. Yes. And that leads in, of course, to verse uh, uh, 6, the next little section there, verses 6 through uh, 8, where in, in those days, in the latter days, uh, in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto his people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, and of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees, uh, well refined. And this, of course, reminds you of, of section 58 in the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord in the last days is going to prepare that feast. And in the context of uh, section 58, it really is talking about the, the restoration of the gospel in the latter days in, in verse 8. And also that a feast of fat things might be prepared for the poor and a feast of fat things, the same thing Isaiah is talking about. Because, as verse 7 says, um, 
the laying of the foundation of Zion in the latter days has begun. And this, uh, in verse 9, a supper of the, Lord, of the house of the Lord, well prepared, unto which all nations shall be invited. Everyone's going to be invited. But in the end, the Lord is the one who uh, is going to perform the miracle and uh, mm. do it through the poor, the lame, the blind, and the deaf during the restoration period and bring about his holy purposes. Let me ask you a question here. He, he, in, beginning in verse 6, he begins to talk about, and in this mountain, and he uses that term several times as he goes through these verses. Is it also possible this is temple imagery here as well? I don't think we can get away, away with, yeah. uh, from that, that idea. Yeah. Right. The, the, the concept that you, you come to the mountain and I have a feast of fat things. I come to the supper of the Lord. Well, where do we get that? Will we get it from the ordinances in the temple, yeah. from the yeah. teachings talk and about the instructions feast. in the temple? Yeah, that's, that's, that's what happens in the temple. From from the whole restoration, I uh, I think yeah. it's uh, even it includes the temple certainly, but I think it includes but much all of the too. instructions. Yeah. And, and I agree with that. The, the, yeah. the, the, yes. And 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 what what are fat things, and particularly wines on the lees? <laughs> what are we what are we looking at, you guys that uh, had the Hebrew down? I'm not certain uh, uh, this is something the Latter-day Saints want to get into. It probably means, although the Hebrew here is a little bit troublesome, uh, a feast of wine on the, wines on the lees. The lees, that's the sediment that you get after the wine has sat for a while. So what it's talking about is well-aged wine here. It's, it's supposed to be good wine that's going to be offered by the Lord. And, and that's the point. I mean, we, yeah, exactly. we, we may have trouble with the... Uh, you know, yeah. in, in our modern society, you know, we... Fat is terrible. We we try to avoid it, but back then, you know, oh. fat was was the ideal thing. It's a delicacy. It's a delicacy. Yes. This, this was a fat phobic society, because fatness meant uh, prosperity and blessings and somebody caring for you and the good things given exactly. to you as well. Yeah, yes. and, and therefore, to afford wine on the lees meant that you were yeah. upper, you, you you were able to afford the yeah. best of the best. And then, of course, there is this this beautiful praise in verse eight speaking about he will swallow up death in victory and the Lord will wipe away tears from off their faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth for the Lord has spoken and that that last you know it's the oath of the Lord he has promised the faithful and and what I like about uh, this particular verse is is the intimacy of the Lord we, we pick up the same thing in the book of Revelation where after the conflict and the trials are over and uh, the saints are with the Lord. He, he, he takes care of each one of them to, to attend to their wounds, to their heartaches, to the sorrows, no, I, and to I, take I it all away. I envision a mother with her child, you know, as she comes up and, you know, she has, kisses the <laughs> wounds and, and wipes away the tears. And that's what Christ, he has that, that personal, intimate uh, interest in us. Uh, and and, and it, it's a beautiful picture you get from that. He, he also says here, too, that he'll take away the rebuke of his people, mm -hmm. that those that have waited patiently upon the Lord will be an object of scorn to the worldly people, and um, they'll be made a mockery, and that, that'll be taken from them. Reminds me a bit of uh, Book of Mormon. Prior to the uh, birth of Christ, you remember, Nephi and his people were... Uh, condemned for their belief and uh, re even scheduled for execution until he till the signs were fulfilled and then people were rethinking <laughs> what they had planned. Yes. I exactly. think it's going to be very exactly. similar right. in this case here. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Mike. Ver verse nine <clears throat> I, uh, changes the, uh, the, the focus again yeah, the here. Complexion is going and, to and this I, I really like. Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. Uh, we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Uh, there, there's a, a wonderful play on words here because in Hebrew, salvation is uh, uh, Yeshua, uh, Yeshua, and Jesus is Yeshua, mm -hmm. who, which means Jehovah is our Savior. And so this, this is a clear reference to Jesus Christ at, at his, uh, the announcement of his birth. Gabriel says, you'll call his name Jesus because he will save his people. And so this, this is another one of those clear prophecies of Christ uh, here by Isaiah. He's, we're going to look and say, here's our Savior. He's the one who did it. Uh, and, and we waited a long time for him to yeah, come. Yeah, we, we waited. And, and it's been well worth the wait. Mm -hmm. Because in verse 10 you have, uh, uh, for in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest. That is, with this latter-day work, with temples and priesthood and all of that, the Lord is there with his hand resting on it, protecting it, guiding and leaning along. And the opposite of that, 
which is symbolized here by Moab, the world shall be trodden down under him, even as straw is trodden, trodden down for the dunghill. <laughs> yeah, and then that leads us into the psalm in chapter 28. In that day shall the song be sung 26. in the land of Judah. What did I say? 28. 26. 26. Oh, yeah. That's, 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 I sound like I'm correcting you too much. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm glad you're doing it. So uh, in 26, then we have this. And in that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city, salvation. Will God appoint for walls and for bulwarks, open ye the gates, and the righteous nations which keep the truth may enter in. What, what a glorious time when Judah or Jerusalem at last is the holy city and people are drawn to it. And we've already read uh, here already in chapter 2 that, uh, you know, at that day the nation shall flow unto it, meaning the temples of God, but also the holy city. And we cannot over, overlook uh, Jerusalem and Judah as part of that blessing. This uh, thing here where it says that in verse two, uh, three, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace mm. whose mind is stayed on thee. If your mind is, is rested upon the Lord, if, if you're focused on the Lord, perfect peace comes. The, the, the perfect peace there in Hebrew is, is simply the repetition of shalom. Shalom, shalom. Mm. And, uh, peace upon peace. Peace upon peace. Yeah. And, and uh, again in Hebrew, shalom <laughs> means much more than just peace. It, it means well-being. Uh, all of uh, all of that, that, that that's combined together here. If your mind is is focused on the Lord, if you uh, then then you have that peace that passeth understanding. Mm -hmm. Very good. Therefore, the admonition is: Trust ye in the Lord forever, for the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Paul, you were going to say something. Yeah, I wanted to say something about that verse. It, it might puzzle some of our readers there. Why the Lord there is in all capital letters, and Jehovah also is in all capital letters. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Hebrew there has uh, for in, it says, Beyah Adonai Tsur Olamim. That is, uh, the first word, Lord, where, that has the small capital letters, is a shortened form of the name of Jehovah. Well, the second one, which is in all large capital letters, is the tetragrammaton, the name Jehovah. So there's a repetition of here, uh, the uh, Jehovah Jehovah is everlasting. Uh, the King James translators um, uh, got a nice uh, feeling for that there, but the Hebrew really says the rock of eternities. Mm -hmm. Rock of ages. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. For the, for the Lord Jehovah is the rock of ages. It's the, he's the rock. He's the cornerstone that the builders rejected, and so on. That we'll talk about in a minute. All right. Yeah. Very good. Uh, therefore, we come to verse five, which uh, is the background to the praise, and that is, for God hath brought down them that dwell on high, the lofty city he layeth it low, he layeth to low, even to the ground, and he bringeth it even to the dust. The, the Lord is now again moved against those, the haughty city, the, the lofty city here, but haughty people in other places, and of course, and this, this immediately down. brings to mind uh, the vision of Lehi and Nephi, the, the High, oh yeah, the, the, the building there, mm -hmm. uh, up in the air, and people looking down and mocking them. Uh -huh. Yeah, very good. And then we find uh, in verse ten, the uh, the understanding of why the lofty city is brought down. Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the Lord of uprightnesses. Uh, he will deal unjustly, you know, even in the face of the Lord's power, he will deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. That, that's the problem. It, it's a willful blindness. Yeah. Verse 11 underscores that as well. Lord, when they see thy hand is lifted up, they will not see it. They just refuse to see the, the Lord working in things when, when it's so manifestly evident to those who yes, have faith. The signs of the times are there. They're everywhere, and yet people can't see it. It reminds us of uh, the Lord's uh, admonition uh, in Joseph Smith, or excuse me, in Matthew chapter 24, also in Joseph Smith, Matthew, where he castigates those uh, in the last days, for they shall be likened to the people of Noah, who, in spite of the prophecy, uh, in spite of the preaching of the gospel, and in spite of the signs of the times, can, can, uh, continue to marry and to give into marriage, to try to perpetuate their society. Again, we see it repeated in these last days. Uh, I, I would like to not skip verse nine. That's verse fine, verse yeah. nine is one that, that really resonates uh, within me. 
With my soul I have desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me I will seek thee early. Uh, the, the yearning that the righteous feel for, for God is, is described so beautifully here by Isaiah. He, he was a, just a quintessential literary genius. <laughs> yeah, and so, so we see here then the juxtaposition of those who hunger after the Lord, who want the Spirit of the Lord, and then those who, who can't see the Spirit of the Lord, refuse to see the Spirit of the Lord, and so on. Let's get down to near the end of the chapter to to, to kind of tie it all back together. Please. Uh, In in verse 20, um, after he's talked about in verses 16 through 19, the the people uh, who have uh, not been going about it the right way and therefore have brought forth in in verse 18 wind and so on and not deliverance and so on. In verse 20, come my people, that is the house of Israel, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. That is, uh, hide yourself from the world until the Lord has has brought forth his work and has made it possible for us to come out of hiding. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Everything's going to be brought right in the end. Yeah, it's, it's there, there's there's clear Passover sim- symbology here as well, because what happened in the Passover, they, they put the blood on the doors, and then they went in, and the destroyer came and destroyed just, everyone else. And so, they were told not to come out. Yeah, don't you come don't out. Don't come out, and, out of the doors. That's, that's, that's the imagery here. So Stay within the folds of the protection of the gospel. Bingo, that's it. Yeah, that's what they look. I'm going to come against the world. Therefore, you, my people, stay within the folds of the gospel, and all will be well. Well, thank you very much. It's good to have been with you this day. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.